about it. You know, of, of all the extraordinary relationships, of course, in modern American history, um, the only thing maybe that's more incredible than the fact that we had a father see his son um, follow him into the White House is that this particular father, George Herbert Walker Bush, saw one actual son and one virtual son follow him into the White House. Um, these two men become so close that the Bush clan, which as you know, you're not a serious member of the Bush clan until they have given you a nickname, calls him their brother from another mother. <laughs> one historical fact on this one really quick. George W. Bush is the first president in American history to leave office with both parents alive. And of course, they were all back at the White House two weeks ago. And I, and, and, and I think when the other son wasn't invited to that event, I think he got a little upset. Uh, not all is um, kumbaya in the President's Club. While we were heartened by how often the personal relationship can be very productive and warm, it also can be ferociously bitter. And, and so you look at Harry Truman and Dwight Eisenhower, two men who worked very closely and productively together during Truman's presidency. They shaped the post-war world together with the Marshall Plan, with the founding of NATO, with the idea of collective security. They were, high, they were a highly effective team. And to the point that in 1948, Harry Truman said to Eisenhower, you know, if you want to run for president, I'll get out of the way. I'll be your vice president. That's how close they were. In 1952, when Eisenhower does decide to run, and to the horror of uh, Truman and many other people, turns out not to be a Democrat, um, he's running as a Republican. Uh, Truman initially is very supportive, very admiring, and respectful of him all along, until the point at which he feels that Eisenhower failed to stand up to Joe McCarthy uh, during that campaign, and missed an opportunity to denounce McCarthy. And it started a feud so bitter between these two men and so personal that the 1952 campaign, the New York Times said, was not really between Adlai Stevenson and Dwight Eisenhower, it was between Harry Truman and Dwight Eisenhower. They did not speak. Truman did not step foot back in the White House through the entire Eisenhower presidency. But these relationships have a way of unfolding in interesting ways. They reunite and they reconcile when they are forced together in November of 1963 and they share a limousine home from Arlington Cemetery and Kennedy's burial. And Truman says to Eisenhower, why don't you come in for a drink? And that's how the two men rekindle their friendship. Probably the fiercest, most high stakes battle that ever occurred, uh, which played out over two elections, three continents, five years, was between uh, these two grand chess masters, Richard Nixon and Lyndon Johnson. And what was extraordinary about them was that it was over the highest possible stakes. This one was not personal. This one was about, truly about war and peace and life and death. And in the 1968 campaign, in the very final days, Lyndon Johnson discovered, through some rather dodgy and sensitive intelligence sources, that hmm. Nixon's people had been undermining the Vietnam peace talks in Paris in order to prevent a breakthrough which was the one thing Johnson wanted more than anything, was to leave office finally as a peacemaker. Um, that deal fell apart. Johnson realized that Nixon had had a hand in it. He called it treason privately. He had to decide whether he would expose this attempt at sabotage, this what he called treason. And he decided at that moment not to, because 1968, as you may remember, was a very explosive year in this country's history, and he actually didn't think the country could take it. This is one reason why, in the years that followed, Nixon was exceptionally solicitous of Johnson, bought the clubhouse, planned his birthday parties, sent a jet down to Johnson on his ranch in Texas to brief him, um, did everything he could to keep him happy, until the moment came as Watergate is gathering force and Nixon's men reach out to Johnson and say, you know, you need to get your friends in the Senate to back off on this Watergate investigation, or else we'll reveal that you actually were illegally listening in on us during the 1968 campaign, at which point Johnson says, well, if you do that, then I'll reveal what I learned when I illegally listened in on you in the 1968 <laughs> campaign. This is how they play the game. That was a double blackmail story. Uh, well, some pictures just don't need a caption. Um, here you have, you know, the current President's Club is made up of uh, 
Two men born in 1946, Clinton and George W. Bush, only six weeks apart, the closest two presidents born in American history, and these two men, both born in 1924, both turning 88 this year, um, very different, not much more in common than those dates. Um, uh, when George W. Bush, George Herbert Walker Bush becomes president, he expands the club's privileges dramatically. He offers all the former presidents a secure phone. He sends them monthly newsletters. And despite attempts to kind of wrap them all on his team, and he worked really hard at it, Carter just wouldn't join. Carter is the thing that binds the rest of the club. Every club needs a black sheep, and Carter is the one who binds the others together. He's a difficult partner. He also will become, in September, the longest living former president in American history, surpassing Herbert Hoover's record of 31 years, 8 months, and 21 days. Carter reinvented the idea of a post-presidency. You, of course, have had him here. He works very hard, but he is a difficult partner and a member of the club. Speaking of which, <laughs> this lately has not been the, the match made in heaven. A lot of good eye contact in this picture, I noticed. <laughs> uh, of course, lately, the two men have not been on the same, as well, singing from the same hymnal. Um, it was tough. They started in 2008 when uh, Barack Obama ran against Bill Clinton's wife. Um, at, in that campaign, uh, Clinton called uh, Obama a fairy tale. Obama had other kind, unkind things to say about Clinton. They've spent the last years trying to find a working partnership. At moments, Obama has been desperate for Clinton's advice and help. At other moments, I think he'd like to put him on a rocket to the moon. <laughs> We're in one of those phases right now. <laughs> but what we found was extraordinary, and again, consistent all the way through, is that by and large, for all the feuds and for all the rivalries, the one thing that they tend to agree on is that America needs a successful presidency, that America, to be safe and to be prosperous, needs for the institution of the presidency to function. And so the club acts as almost a shadow secret service, protecting the office itself. So here we have. Hoover and Truman again allied uh, in a second mission together, which was to reinvent the executive branch uh, in a way that would allow post-war presidents to handle the challenges of the nuclear age. They made the office more powerful, and it only would have happened with a Democratic president enlisting a Republican former president to do that re-engineering of the executive branch. It happened locally, and more extraordinarily in this picture, which occurred a few days after the harrowingly close 1960 election, when what Kennedy needed more than anything was for Nixon to acknowledge Kennedy's victory and not challenge the vote, as many Republicans were urging him to do because of some pretty sketchy vote counting that was going on in Texas and Illinois. And so uh, Kennedy was down recuperating from the campaign in Palm Beach. Uh, Nixon was also in Florida at the same time. And Joe Kennedy calls Herbert Hoover and asks Hoover to call Nixon about the two candidates meeting in order to have this picture. And Hoover tells Nixon, don't, don't challenge the count. I, I think we're in enough trouble in the world already. It was, as an example to emerging democracies, a smooth transition was necessary. So Nixon listens to Hoover, hangs up the phone, picks it up, calls Eisenhower. What do you think? Eisenhower tells him the same thing. Two Republican former presidents, neither of whom had any desire to see John F. Kennedy in the White House, advising Nixon not to challenge the results for the good of the presidency itself. One of the many delicious stories uncovered in the President's Club, this is just one, is a meeting that most, again, most people think never happened. The year here is 1992. Uh, Clinton has just been elected. He has not yet been sworn in. He's in Los Angeles, and he decides to pay a courtesy call on the 40th president, Ronald Reagan, a man he'd only met once. He goes over to Century City in LA, goes up the elevator to Reagan's office. Again, it's 1992. Uh, and he says, we're just sit around and talk. And at one point, Clinton says in this 90-minute meeting, do you have any advice for me? And, and Reagan says, yes, I think you should get to Camp David as often as you can, because it's good for the heart and soul. But there's one other thing that's been bugging me that I do need to help you with. And he says, I've been watching you on the campaign trail, and you know, you, you just don't know how to salute. It's kind of a wimpy salute. And Clinton, who'd never been in the service, uh, said, OK, well, so teach me. And so the two men, Reagan, of course, had been in the service, both uh, in fact and in the movies. And, <laughs> 
and Reagan had an exquisite understanding that the role perception plays in the modern presidency, maybe as important as any policy, how you look and how you perform the role. Well, anyway, Clinton was all ears. And the two men stood up in Reagan's you know, office there, overlooking LA, and practiced their salutes. And at the end of the practice session, Reagan awarded Clinton with a jar of jelly beans, which sat on Clinton's desk for eight years. So just before the current president was inaugurated, he asked his predecessor, George W. Bush, to assemble the club, something that doesn't happen very often, all of them together at the White House. And at that time, um, it was an extraordinary moment, partly because of just the range and the breadth of these men all coming together. They didn't come to talk about Congress or Afghanistan. They talked about, here's, here's how we can help you about living in this house, raising girls in this house, a lot of modern presidential daughters. Um, so Clinton had been through this, Carter had been through this, Bush had been through this. Um, and at the time, George W. Bush said something that we heard again and again about the office itself. We want you to succeed. Democrat or Republican, we understand that the office transcends the individual. And so what we have heard as we have been traveling and talking to people is, is you know, how much of an exception is this in our politics of the idea that people who have tremendous differences, as they all did, who disagree in profound ways about politics and policy, can still find a common ground that actually allows them to work together for a common purpose, for the good of the country at large. They have done it. They do it publicly at times. They do it privately very often. And I think there is perhaps a lesson and a model in that for many of us in many areas of our lives, that if these guys can do it, um, then probably anyone can. Thank you very much.